welcome. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be to be able to welcome you here. Uh, my name is Ivan Kroichev, and I'm uh, the um, I'm the lead for the Great Minds Project. I'm an academic psychiatrist at Oxford, um, and uh, for those of you that are not aware, this particular event that we've been organizing for uh, for three years now, every six months, is under the auspices of the Great Minds Project. So presumably some of you are already part of part of Great Minds, for which I'm very grateful. Um, as, a, as a recap, the, the reason why we set up Great Minds is because we now know a lot more about dementia and, and what... Uh, Causes the causes people to get to develop dementia, specifically as they age, and part of that knowledge is the, the recognition that dementia is a process that is, that is decades in the making. So uh, the, the the processes that specifically that lead to Alzheimer's disease uh, can be detected 20 to 30 years before first symptoms, and as part of this, there is there is an understandable need for, for us as the clinicians and researchers to, to identify people who are at risk in this preclinical stage because this, this, this initial period, um, although it may seem daunting uh, to some of us, at the same time it offers the, the potential opportunity to intervene in, in, in this dementia process before it actually causes, uh, causes the damage that, uh, that we see patients in, in the clinic with. So Great Minds builds on this, on this idea uh, because over the years, a number of, of epidemiological cohorts, so these are studies, have collected a lot of data on people in the UK. All of this data now sits in Dementia's Platform UK. We have more than 2 million individuals who have been part of studies. And so this, this if you like, this data is, is, an, is, a, is a wonderful opportunity to uh, to to actually put these uh, this knowledge about dementia into action because we can identify the risk factors uh, for dementia at starting from from middle age and uh, then offer people who may be at risk the opportunity to participate in the in the latest research in in, in brain health and that's really what drove us to to create Great Minds um, that was that was four years ago now. Uh, and, uh, you know, with your support, I have to say, it's been a tremendous success. We've had more than 6,000 people sign up uh, and uh, uh, both uh, do all the, the things that we ask you to do, like uh, we're sending uh, genetic kits to look at genetic risk, fa risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we ask people to uh, complete cognitive tests online, and, and, and I'm very grateful for the time you, you spend doing this. Um, but the, but the end result is that we, we are starting to deliver studies. We have over 18 studies that are being offered to people in great minds with, uh, with our academic uh, and industry partners. So a big thank you to, to all of you. Um, and moving on swiftly to, to what we have for you today is, uh, is an event in, in, in the tradition of the way that we've been organizing these, these events. It always focuses on, on one particular topic that we find is of interest, um, and and you know, it, things are as as the the field moves at a rapid pace. It's always worth uh, spending a bit of time to review the evidence, and and see where we're at. In this today, we're going to be talking about how the environment that we live in uh, affects our risk for for dementia, uh, and in a way, by extension, also the way that we perceive the environment. Uh, whether that's a risk factor for dementia. So we've got three speakers. Um, they're all they're all going to give a slightly different view of, of what we know about about this this particular topic. We're going to start off with Professor Gallagher, uh, who's joining us remotely, who's going to talk about the the effect of urbanicity, the, the effect that living in cities have on on our risk for dementia. Then uh, Dr. Ian Mudway is going to talk about air pollution and the effect of air pollution on, on brain health, starting, uh, you know, throughout the life course. Uh, and then after a tea break, we're going to hear from Professor Sarah Baumeister at Oxford, who was going to join us in person, but um, uh, was, uh, you know, had to stay, had to stay at Oxford um, uh, today. She's going to be talking about the, the way that hearing <coughs> loss and vision loss affect 
um, affect cognition. So without further ado, we're going to start off with Professor Gallagher. Uh, those of you that have been regular to these meetings have heard John speak before. Uh, he's an expert in brain health and the use of big data in medical research. He, is, he has a visiting professorship here at Imperial College London and an honorary professorship at the University of Hong Kong. And he's also the principal investigator for the Kefili Prospective Study, which is one of the main cohorts in the UK. And John, you're going to talk to us about healthy cities. Is that right? Uh, I am indeed, Ivan. Um, uh, my apologies for not being with you in person. The lurgy has caught up with me. <clears throat> and I'm sure if I just <coughs> cough to order, I'm sure that uh, you'd rather I was here than, than there with you. I'm going to talk about healthy cities. Um, this is a really complicated uh, area. Um, and I hope to show you why it's really complicated, but also why it is really, really important. OK, so let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> OK, next slide. Wonderful. Wonder None of the one before that, please. So the <clears throat> we, we're used to designing our cities to reduce the risk of infectious disease. There was the sanitary movement at the uh, early on in earlier centuries, which reduced the risk of cholera. And also you're more than familiar with uh, how we adjusted life in cities uh, to reduce the risk of COVID. Uh, but when it comes to chronic disease like <clears throat> heart disease or even dementia, uh, we've made very, very little progress. Uh, and what I'm going to do this afternoon briefly is just address uh, how we can make progress and demonstrate some of the progress that we have been made. So if we go on to the next slide, the basic question is, what do you mean by a city? Do you mean a formal, highly intensive, uh, highly uh, dense uh, environment? Or if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> do you mean a very informal, uh, environments such as the favela uh, outside Rio de Janeiro. And of course, you can imagine that these two conurbations are very different uh, and how you would express good public health in each of them would vary, but it would come down nevertheless to some basic principles. So if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> I'd like to ask you, let's just look at the borough of Caerphilly. Uh, for those of you in South Wales, I spent uh, many decades in Cardiff and the Caerphilly study was, uh, and the borough of Caerphilly was my stomping ground, um, uh, even though I don't have any uh, Welsh accent. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the borough of Caerphilly. Now, what I want to ask you <clears throat> is, is this one borough, because there, is, there, it, there it is, this mapped out for you, if we go on to the next slide, or is it several communities? For those of you who know it, we see Blackwood up in the north with Ustrad Monarch just below it. And then there's Machen off to the right uh, and Caerphilly uh, in the center. And then to the left, there's a community called Nelson. Now, <clears throat> all of these are quite distinct in their character. Uh, okay, Caerphilly might be the big conurbation, relatively speaking, but nevertheless, uh, it is, they will have different, uh, different elevations. Uh, they will have different intensity of amenity. They'll have different exposure to greenness. And all of these things would affect how uh, the environment will impact the well-being of those people who, who live there. So we go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Basically, there are um, uh, four really difficult, challenging uh, methodological issues. First of all, there's what we call the ecological fallacy, which means that if I take numbers or statistics from the population, if I just said, what is the average alcohol consumption in Caerphilly? and compared that with the average alcohol consumption in uh, Ustrad Merch, that may be different. <clears throat> uh, a second issue would be the modifiable area uh, unit problem. Now, what this means is that I could do an analysis of the town of Caerphilly, but if I just stretched out the uh, distances into to include Nelson or to include Ustrad Merch, then the results would, would be different. And then the question is, well, what's the right? What's the right result? <clears throat> now, the way around this is that you don't measure areas, you measure individuals. And that's what we've done, because if you look at individuals, the relationship between, let's say, alcohol and heart disease 
alcohol and dementia is roughly the same for individuals in a way that it is not for communities. So that's the ecological fallacy. We look at individuals, not communities. <clears throat> and if you're looking at individuals, you can measure areas from the distance from that person, for if you like, from that person's address to the local pub, from that person's address to the local motorway. So you can, if you like, map very closely what area of interest you're interested in. Now, there are two other areas, modified uh, methodological problems, which I think you may want to know, understand. One is the issue of it being too small, and the other is the issue of it being subjectively assessed. So let's look at too small if we go on to the next slide. And it should come up with a graph. Is there a graph on there? Yes, wonderful. If you did an analysis of blood pressure and heart disease on 5,000 people, which is quite a, quite a large number, um, and you divided it into different age groups, it would be very hard to make sense of that. If we go on to the next slide. It should come up with a second graph. Lovely. If you then increase the sample size to 50,000 adults, then it makes a bit more sense. But you're not sure whether the relationship is a straight line or whether it's a J-shaped curve. Nevertheless, you're making a bit more sense of it. And if we could go on to the third graph. If you looked at 500,000 adults, then you would get a definitive result. This is the result. You do not need to do this experiment again. That is the answer. So that's the value of size. And what we would like to do is to investigate the impact of the environment at scale. So let's go on to the next slide. And here we're going to be looking at objective assessment. So we're not asking you, how do you feel about the number of trees in your road, as legitimate as that is, um, or we're not asking you, how do you feel about living on a, a slope. Now, this may not be very important if you're living in the home counties, but if you're living in the Welsh Valleys, it really is important. OK, so rather than ask me how you feel, well, we're actually measuring what is the slope on your uh, outside your house? What is the gradient which you have to manage each day? So again, that gives us a much more precise way of measuring. If we can go on to the next one as well. We could also look at greenness. Again, we're not asking you how green is your valley. We're, we're actually telling you how green is your valley. And again, it allows us to make much more, many more precise um, measurements. So let's go on to having understood the complexity, defining what a city is, defining a community. Is it a functional community, as in uh, Ostromonic and Kefili, or is it an administrative community, as in Kefili Borough? We could now look at does it affect dementia? OK, so let's look at this now. So here we have a graph showing residential density along the bottom uh, and uh, risk of dementia along the, the left hand side. Uh, and you see there is a there is a slight increase as it goes up. Now, if we were to look at Alzheimer's disease, again, we uh, we with that urbanicity, again, we saw a less of a rise, but then a sort of slight rise. So then the question is, does this mean that the more dense the population, the greater your risk of dementia, i.e. does population density increase your risk? Well, that would be a very, very cavalier interpretation because cities are much more complicated than that. What's really going on behind the scenes? Is it because you have dementia, you're not in a position to move out to a less uh, dense area. Uh, or is it the fact that if you're living close, cheek by jowl with people, then your risk is increased. So I show this slide now just to make the point that there is an association, but I would be very careful about just considering it as causal. But I would, I would suspect that it's just a bit more complicated than that. So let's give you some examples. So let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> OK, here we have uh, air pollution, and I'm sure that we'll get uh, much better data on this uh, in the next talk. But unsurprisingly, the, the, more, the, the larger the number of very small particles, the worse your lung function. Um, and uh, in terms of both uh, disease uh, and in terms of 
just your ability to breathe in in a standard way to a machine. So what this shows you is that the air, the air quality does affect um, your lungs. And then you could argue, well, will the air quality that affect your lungs also affect your brain? Because if you're not able to breathe very well, then of the, the, if you like, the oxygenation getting to the brain is, is less. So let's go on to the next one. This is an interesting one, arterial stiffness uh, and walkability. Now, what do I mean by walkability? Well, if, if you're able to uh, go out into a green space, if you don't have massive cars running in front of, you know, driving around in front of, immediately in front of your door, et cetera, et cetera, then you're more able to go out and enjoy going for a walk. Also, in, interestingly, um, if you don't have uh, uh, public transport, then you have to go for a walk. Or if your amenities are close by, then it's easier to go for a walk. You don't jump into a car to go to the corner shop. Well, at least I don't. Um, you know, some of, some of you may. Uh, I, would, I would suggest against it because the more you walk, the less stiff your arteries are. And it's a very, very nice relationship here. And again, that reflects into your risk for dementia because the less stiff your arteries are, the lower your blood pressure, <clears throat> the lower the pressure, if you like, in the vasculature of the brain, the lower the risk of vascular dementia. So again, it's not just a matter of the big, big picture does living in a city, it's a matter of actually what aspects of living in a city affect your health? Because when we know that, then we can design the city to minimize that risk. So let's go on to the next one. So looking, just follow on the theme of arterial stiffness and blood pressure. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, blood pressure and again, walkability, but we're looking at it in terms of different groups. So you might consider yourself to be relatively mature and senior. Well, that's the top line here. And for you, walking is definitely beneficial. You might consider yourself to be middle-aged. You might consider yourself to be younger. Well, nevertheless, whatever your age group, going through a walk is good for your blood pressure. And if you look at different genders as well, again, um, the blood pressure will be higher in males and females. But for going for a walk, it produces that same benefit for each gender. And if we just uh, look at the next slide, we could look at blood pressure and uh, residential density, walkability according to residential density. And again, we get exactly the same position. Whether you live in the country, whether you live in a high rise flat, whether you're old, young, <clears throat> male or female, going for a walk is good for you. So I would just really encourage you to consider how you might go for a walk. <clears throat> Now, if we go on to the next one, this is my favorite graph of the whole lot, actually. Um, <clears throat> uh, this is looking at, uh, is there an optimum residential density for uh, whole body fat? Okay. And what it shows you is that uh, at A, that is the worst for body fat. But at A, the residential density there is, we all get into a car and go everywhere. If you have less residential density off to the left, then we go for walks in the country. And if you have more residential density off to the right, well, then it's not worth getting in a car. We actually go for a walk to get the shopping. Uh, we go for a walk for our amenities, et cetera, et cetera. So what this shows us is that you can design a city where there is an optimum value in terms of health. And I, I think this is really interesting because if you can do that, then you can design cities which will have impact across the globe and across generations. So the effects might be small, but actually they would be globally uh, widespread. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> it's not just a matter of being able to protect your health. It's a matter of being able to live well, with whatever your health. So let's just say you've got two street plans. They're, they're identical, but the way you navigate those street plans uh, will vary. So a young person might say, well, I want, I want the shortest possible um, route because I'm in a hurry. And they might use the street. They might use the route on the left. 
But an older person like me might say, I just want the simplest route possible. I don't want to be remembering 25 different corners that I have to go through. So I would use the street plan on the right. So again, you can organize environments, not just to um, <clears throat> uh, promote good health, but actually to help you live well and live independently. And the, the example of this uh, I find, which uh, you know, I'm a bit embarrassed to say is myself. Uh, I was born in London and you know, before I went to university and for about 10 years afterwards, I could drive through East and West London end to end through all the back streets, no problem at all, okay? So I would go use the, the map on the left. Um, <clears throat> it was just there imprinted in my mind. Now, I use the simplest route, it's called the M25, okay? Uh, I hate it, but it is simple. <clears throat> I don't have to think and I just get there anyway. So that just shows you how you can design a city and how you navigate a city to promote your well-being and your independence. <clears throat> so let's go on to the final slide. Okay, so what, what are we saying here? <coughs> Cities can be designed to be healthier. The benefits might be small for individual factors, <clears throat> but, they are, can, but they are there. The benefits apply across generations. Interestingly, <coughs> any single solution is a compromise across health outcomes. Oh, excuse me. Um, what's good for heart disease may not be so good for dementia, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> but you always need large studies to identify the best solutions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I think we have a couple of minutes to go through some questions. We have people online and we have those of you that are in the room. Are there any immediate questions to John? One person in the room. Yeah. How do you... Um how do, you, <clears throat> how do you persuade the um, town planners that this is a good idea, or the developers? Wow, there's a question. Um, I think you really have to show the evidence, um, and that's going back to large studies. <clears throat> if you go to town planners and say, we think that trees are a good idea, they'll go, yeah or no. If you can demonstrate that trees affect mental health uh, and demonstrated at scale, not in 15 people answering a questionnaire, <clears throat> but at a whole community not using mental health services so much, they will listen. <coughs> we have some questions online, so I'll just... Uh... Uh, there, there's some questions about causality, John, and so, some some comments that you made that it's difficult to prove causality um, on d dementia and in the city. But but you commented on uh, causality between lung air lung and air pollution. So and and also can can we infer uh, in, information um, causality? Um, the direction of causality, because uh, it might be that people that uh, that are iller choose to move closer to hospitals. So, can, do you want to make a comment about causality in information? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> this is a, this is a really good question. It's a really important issue. But because of my throat, I will be brief. <clears throat> If you measure something and then the disease happens afterwards, then that's a, you know, a reason to infer causality. <clears throat> so for dementia, you can measure uh, population density, and then you can say, okay, how many new cases of dementia do we find? And are they related to population density? <clears throat> Another way of doing it is that there are some things which, um, <clears throat> the reverse way of the reverse causation just does not work. Um, 
Um, uh, so I can't give you an example exactly, but um, <clears throat> it'd be very hard to, well, I can, it'd be very hard to consider that dementia causes an increase in air pollution. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but is it plausible? Uh, it's much more likely that the air pollution would cause an increase in dementia. <clears throat> so I'll keep it brief for now. <coughs> you, we'll let you get a breather. Um, and then uh, if you're staying for the FNQs, we can, we can get back to any other questions uh, we have for you. Great. So moving on swiftly then, we have Dr. Ian Mudway. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in environmental toxicology in the uh, MRC Centre for Environment and Health at Imperial College London, and he's a visiting professor of environmental health at Gresham College. He's a member of the UK Government's Committee on the Medical Effects of Air Pollution and has advised widely on air pollution and health for the EU, WHO, local and national government and NGOs. His work is currently focused on understanding early in life and late life impacts on, of pollutants on the lung and brain in urban populations, as well as furthering our fundamental understanding of the mechanisms that drive these adverse events and modifying individuals' long-term susceptibility to air pollution. Um, he has a long-standing interest in uh, communicating science to, uh, to wider audiences, and I'm, very, I'm looking forward to, to his talk. We'll just need to give you a microphone because there's people online. Can you hear me like this? Sound good? Sound better? I may have to walk around like I'm some sort of comedian, so you'll have to, <laughs> maybe I am. Um, my background is I study air pollution science, okay? So normally I have an audience of people who know something about air pollution and why I would even think it's worth having a conversation about it. But I'm not assuming that today, yes? I'm going to assume that you know nothing. I, my job is to convince you that the quality of the air that we breathe is important, and that the quality of the air that we breathe can have an impact on our long-term brain health and contribute to increased dementia risk. And that means I'm going to spin out lots of relatively large numbers and try to take you on a journey of where actually you're going to spend a lot of time going, is this correlation, is this causation, and I'm primed for it after the last talk. First thing, globally, air pollution is a huge issue. issue. How big an issue is it? It is the number one environmental cause of premature mortality globally. Greater than malaria, greater than AIDS, greater than cigarette smoking, combined. The numbers are huge, astronomical, and sometimes make it very difficult for people to get a handle on the actual topic. So if we're looking at air pollution outside, and they're usually in these studies talking about the concentrations of fine particles in the air, and fine particles are less than 2.5 microns, so they're in the scale of sort of like microorganisms. They contribute to the loss of 4.2 million lives globally per year. If you then add on to that the number of people who die because of indoor air pollution, and traditionally this is in the developed world where people are burning sort of animal dung or sort of residual crop waste for household heating, there's another 3.8 million. So look, conservatively, we are saying there's between seven to eight million excess deaths a year and most people hearing those numbers would go, surely if that was the case, we would have noticed and somebody would be doing something about this. But it's the nature of the numbers. So what these numbers are, are aggregated up sums of the number of life years lost within the population. Because of course, everybody dies. So what we're looking at in these numbers is the amount of life shortening, which is happening each year as a consequence of the air pollution that we're breathing. And this isn't life shortening because of air pollution being high on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. 
This is live shortening as a consequence of living in an area where there's high air pollution for decades. I tend to think of this as being the equivalent of thinking about the biology of rust, yes? The sort of long-term impact of poor air on our health. So, there's a lot of lost life. And actually, when this slide was made in 2016, I would be able to say that 90% of the global population lived in an area where we knew the levels of air pollution were unsafe. Since then, the science has become more robust, and I can now say it's 99% of the global population live in an area where air pollution is above the levels which are regarded as being safe by the World Health Organization. We also know what people are dying of, or we know what we think we know people are dying of. We have about 1.8 million deaths of lung disease and lung cancer. Most of the lung disease here is actually COPD for the long-term effects. We have 2.5 million deaths of heart disease, 1.4 million deaths of stroke. At the moment, we do not have brain in here at all at this present moment in time. And as I said, that's where these numbers come from. They're largely cardiopulmonary effects. And we know where it's worse. And none of this is going to come as an amazing surprise to you. Where air pollution is really bad, you see most of the harmful effect. So we see it in Southeast Asia, into Central Asia. Africa is a really important area, and that's emerging. But we don't get off scot-free in Europe. In Europe and the European Economic Area, we still have half a million excess deaths occurring every year. So there are places where it is bad, but even within Western Europe, we still have health problems. And I'm going to try to focus this talk on demonstrating to you that air pollution has an impact on air pollution here within the United Kingdom, and actually in places which have far better air pollution in the United Kingdom. So you're not always thinking back to the worst case scenario of Beijing. You can actually go to the WHO website and you can go to their, the actual data behind this and de-aggregate it by country, um, region, age group. So all the data is online. So I'm going to talk about the air pollution we breathe. We're based in London, um, and so here we have a typical air pollution episode in London. These occur generally in the early spring. The sky is brown. That's nitrogen dioxide. That's the gas which predominantly comes from our diesel engines, yes. And you'll see it's a bit hazy, and that haziness is caused by the fine particles in the air. So we still have air pollution episodes within the United Kingdom. We generally think it would be a good idea if the government told you about them you probably don't get told about them enough when they're happening at the present moment in time. We also have standards, and I've just put this here, and I've just wanted to highlight two of the standards. I've talked about the fine particles, and they're 2.5. This is the WHO's guideline. So this is what is the guideline we should be moving towards, or we tell governments they should be moving towards to protect health. And I'm only going to focus on PM 2.5, the annual, that's yearly average level, and currently that's set at five micrograms per metre cubed. Just keep that number in your head, it becomes important. And then we have nitrogen dioxide, which is that brown gas, and its annual level is 10 micrograms per metre cubed. These are guidelines, they're not the legal limits. Governments take these values, and then they decide how they're going to take those values and enact them into law. So legal limits are always higher than this because they consider practicality, economics, a whole range of other factors. But those numbers are important. Why? Because this is the United Kingdom now. So these are air pollution models informed by measurements for the United Kingdom of PM2.5, the fine particles in the air, and over here we have nitrogen dioxide. And what we're looking at is the scale. And what these two maps demonstrate is that A, in the United Kingdom, there are areas where air pollution is below those legal limits, but there are places no one lives. When you get to the areas where people live, we're way over those legal limits. And if you look at this map for nitrogen dioxide, you can begin to pick up our major conurbations, yes? So London, Birmingham, 
sort of like around Manchester area. So we have a significant air pollution problem. We are over the legal limit. It is not just London which is over the legal limit. It is all cities, towns and villages within the United Kingdom. Sometimes that message gets a bit lost in the debates we have. So, back to our known risks. Nobody really thought about the brain until about 2014, 2015. And maybe on reflection, we should have been thinking about the impact of air pollution on the brain much earlier. Simply because we already know that air pollution is associated with increased cardiovascular disease and increased stroke risk. And we know that cardiovascular disease itself and stroke are risk factors for dementia. So in a bizarre way, we have a pathway from vasculature to actually dementia. Certainly if we're thinking about vascular dementia as a dementia entity, we should probably have guessed. And in fact, there's been a bit of an avalanche of press interest and publications over the last under a decade now showing evidence of associations between air pollution and greater risks of dementia, but actually impacts of air pollution across the whole life course, which is interesting when we're considering the fact that we already know that when we're trying to understand dementia, we have to understand the chronology of the evolution of that disease. We can see impacts on children's cognition. We can see impacts on mental health as people transition through adolescence into early adulthood. We can see cognitive decline relationships through middle to late age, and we can see increased dementia risk. Something is definitely going on, but you don't have to believe me. I'm going to show you some of the data this is based on. So I have a few slides here, which I was going to get rid of, but I didn't. This is to point out that sometimes things are known. Um, look, smoking is associated with dementia risk, and basically that's a big slug of air pollution that you're electively doing for yourself. So there's some sort of causal sort of similarity and analogy there. We know that air pollution isn't just causing cardiovascular deaths. It's been linked with blood pressure, hypertension, high cholesterolemia, diabetes risk. So the risk factors themselves for cardiovascular disease, the biochemistry, the blood markers themselves are associated with air pollution. So there's a causal chain. And that potentially gives us links to say, there are probably common pathways, and there are probably similarities in risk and vulnerability factors in the population. I probably have another redundant slide here. And again, this is just to make the point, because when we thought about this, we thought we'd been idiots the whole time, that we should have seen this coming maybe two decades ago, because we could have simply gone, smoking is linked to cardiovascular disease and stroke um, and cognitive decline. Hang on, but air pollution is linked to cardiovascular and stroke. So we could have done a triangulation and just come to the conclusion that there was a really good reason for doing this. We didn't. We didn't. There was one voice out of Mexico City doing studies on stray dogs, finding particles in the brains of stray dogs, comparing it between urban areas and rural areas, and showing that the particles accumulating in the brains of those stray dogs were associated with features, early hallmarks of dementia in those animals. And that work really was ignored at the time. It was regarded as being slightly niche in the background from Mexico. It took a while for it to come online, and it only became online when the epidemiology began to strengthen and people began to re-review where we were. So let's go to some epidemiology. And again, I'm gonna just highlight all these papers are from the last eight to 10 years. So this is quite new. So, these graphs are always very difficult to study. This is very simple. This is the Whitehall cohort. Civil servants, yes, recruited in the 1980s in Westminster, followed across time. There are two periods here, five years apart, and they've done cognitive function tests, and then they've looked at the relationship between air pollution on a range of cognitive measures. And here they're looking at measures of reasoning and measures of memory, and down here, we have all different ways of cutting the way in which air pollution exposures are happening, yes? So here we have fine particles and then larger particles, whether it's an average of a long term over five years, whether it's the day before. But overall, you can see in all cases, reasoning is in that general sort of direction and memory is in that sort of direction as well. So there's some sort of hint that something cognitively is going on in those cohorts. And because it's the Whitehall cohort, it's 
it's corrected for all of those other reasons which you could associate that effect with, yes? All of the confounders have been dealt with, all the confounders that could be identified. Nobody paid much attention to that paper. This is the paper where everybody sat up. And it's a strange paper because in a bizarre sense, it's not about air pollution at all. But this is the point at which people ask the question. And again, picking up on the first presentation, people took notice because of its size, which is always very important, but also because of where it was published, which was in The Lancet. So suddenly this got huge media coverage. Now this doesn't really look at air pollution at all. This looks at a co two cohorts, almost about six million individuals in Ontario in Canada. Very, very low levels of air pollution compared with the United Kingdom. And it looked at dementia, Parkinson's disease, and multiple sclerosis, first diagnosis, and simply related that to how close you lived to a major road. So we can think about this as being near roadedness, if you can use that term, yes? Whether you lived within 50 meters, between 50 to 100 meters, 100 to 200 meters, 200 to 300 meters. And then you're looking here at your increased risk of dementia, and you've got lots of dots here, and this is just the raw data and then controlled for various other things which could explain that. And you can see the closer you live to a road, the greater your risk of developing dementia, and that that risk attenuates the further you move away from the road. So there's something about roads that seems to confer roughly a 5% increased risk of dementia within that cohort of individuals in Ottawa in Canada. That's the point people began to go, what's going on? The inference was, clearly this has got something to do with pollution from traffic, yes? That seems the inference. And there's a follow-up study after this where they address the question again. These graphs are always very difficult to go through, but this is quite straightforward. That's NO2 from diesel vehicles. That's PM2.5 fine particles in the air. When you see NO2, it's really telling you something about the stuff which comes from the tailpipe, yes? from diesel vehicles, so it's not just NO2, it's NO2 and all the really, really small particles which come from the exhaust. PM2.5 is a much more complicated entity, lots of different chemicals. And what they're looking at here is again, the increased risk of a population, again, it's the same population, so although it's a population of eight million, there's about a quarter of a million patients here who have dementia, so it's still pretty chunky. You can see that if you're male or female, there's an increased risk. And actually, there's an increased risk whether you have stroke, diabetes, or hypertension. That risk exists for NO2. But you go to PM2.5, there's no gender difference, but you begin to see differences between groups with stroke, diabetes, and hypertension. And lots of work has gone into this to try to work out whether this is telling us something about whether the link between air pollution is predominantly with Alzheimer's disease or whether the link is stronger with vascular dementia. But your capacity to unpick those questions epidemiologically is really not so straightforward. Lots of other studies, you know, I'm talking about scales here. Now we're up to almost 10 million um, individuals in the US in the Medicare cohort. 50 cities, increased risk in each city associated with uh, per unit increase in PM2.5. The important numbers are here. These are the aggregate in that entire sort of like eastern seaboard region of the United States. Again, they're showing a significant association between the number of fine particles in the air and your risk of developing dementia. So where are we now? We're up to about 90, 2016. Lots of data is beginning to emerge suggesting that there is a correlation that we should be concerned about, yes? And it's not just elsewhere. It's here. So this is London. Um, this is an air pollution map of London. Again, this is nitrogen dioxide. Um, and technically speaking, everything which is yellow in this map is still actually illegal, not just over the guideline, illegal, just to give you the idea that we do have, again, I have to keep on saying we have air pollution problems in the United Kingdom because lots of people would like you to believe that they're in the past. But this is interesting because look, we have air pollution and this is noise. 
but specifically traffic noise. So again, here we're trying to uncouple whether there's something about traffic independent from the pollution which is affecting air pollution. And this is looking at people who registered with their GPs in 2005, there were about 130,000 of them, followed through time and we're looking at the first diagnosis of incident dementia in that group. And this is what we see. So let's look here, they've got NO2 here. Here we have quintiles of exposure and we can see no association, but then as soon as we begin to get up towards 40, we see this big increased risk in dementia risk. We see it with PM2.5, and we see it if we isolate the PM2.5, which specifically comes from traffic. We don't see it with ozone, and noise makes no difference at all. So in London, we have a link between air pollution and dementia incidence. So this is still a correlation, but it's a correlation which is appearing really quite widely across multiple countries, across multiple periods of time, which gives us more confidence that we're looking at something which is real. So concerned with the government that they reviewed the science, and I was part of this review process, and it was chaired by the head of my department, Professor Frank Kelly, by the Committee on the Medical Aspects of Air Pollution, and it just basically did a review, it took years, only came out last year, it's online, you can find this, you can download this, you can see our evaluation, and we looked across the evidence base. And we didn't just look at the epidemiology, we looked at the toxicology mechanistically to see how robust the science was. And I thought it might be worthwhile to tell you what our conclusions were in terms of the epidemiology. Epidemiology never is the final definitive proof. It's the thing which starts us on the quest to work out what's going on. There is no doubt that air pollution, we concluded, was associated with an increased risk of dementia, but we couldn't really definitively say which bit of air pollution it was, and we couldn't completely account for every individual potential confounding factor because life is complicated, and especially life when you consider it over a 30-year period prior to the disease presentation. But on the whole, we were fairly confident there was something that we should be really investing our time understanding it. And one of the things we really said we needed to invest time in was trying to understand the causal pathways. If we have the pattern, we really need to go beyond that to understand the how. How is this happening? The strength of this is that if you go to the Lancet Commissions on Dementia, it's hidden, but now air pollution has appeared, explaining, explaining 2% of the, if you like, modifiable risk of dementia. And that, I suspect, is a percentage which will only increase as we begin to delve deeper into this question. Now, I told you they'd found particles in the brains of dogs. They've also found particles in human brains. And this is a really interesting area Still a bit controversial, but very interesting. So this is a paper which came out around 2016 by Barbara Mayer from the University of Lancaster. And what you're looking at here is human brain homogenates, and these dark particles are nanoparticles of around 40 to around 50 nanometers in diameter. And the brain samples they looked at were full of these particles. Now these particles are predominantly magnetite. Magnetite particles can form in the brain just by normal wear and tear particle processes. But when you actually look at the surface of those particles, you'll see they almost look fractured. Those types of particles can only be formed in high temperature combustion processes, which means these are not endogenous particles formed by wear and tear responses in the body. These are particles which have been breathed and have moved into the brain. How? There's lots of evidence of particle uptake and translocation through the olfactory nerve into the olfactory bulb at the front of the brain, and some evidence that will move from that, that area. There's some evidence that you can see these particles appearing in the blood, but still lots of work to be worked out to see if they could actually cross from the blood over the blood-brain barrier into the brain. But interestingly, they've not just been found in, so this is, a measurement of the amount of magnetite, so the magnetic nature of the sample. 
All of these sort of pink circles here are sort of controlled brains from Mexico City. So these are mostly individuals who've, who've died in, in sort of road traffic accidents. But over here from the Manchester Brain Bank, we begin to see the level of this magnetic iron in individuals who have clinically defined dementia. And this is a log scale, incidentally. So what you're looking at here is a significant increase in magnetic iron in the brains of these individuals. Just to say, the particles are getting there, and if you can show the particles getting there, all the chemicals which are associated with those particles potentially also can get into the brain. So, I'm going to kind of wrap up because I'm sure I've spoken for far too long. I'm just going to mention a few things. I've mentioned that we've seen effects across the life course. This is in children. Cognitive development in children, low pollution versus high pollution schools. We can show impacts on cognition occurring in children. These are primary school age children in Barcelona. We've shown impacts on mental health. This is a very busy graph. But what we're looking at here is exposures to NO2. And these are measures of anxiety and depression. And this is a wonderful study in that we have individual level confounding on these individuals. And these mental health effects, we cannot get to go away. They seem to be pretty robust. And it's just to illustrate that air pollution is bad for brain health overall in a way that we didn't appreciate a decade ago. The reason I want to go through this quite quickly, and I say I'm going to go through these because we can talk about that later, is because I want to talk about something else which I think is really important. I've talked about PM 2.5, yes, as though it's some sort of like adverse dust in the air, and that's often how it's presented in the media. But actually, PM 2.5 is chemically incredibly heterogeneous, and it comes from a variety of different sources. And this is a pie, which is in no way representative of the complexity, but it's just saying that there's going to be some sea salt in there. There's going to be some contributions from exhaust, some contributions from brake wear, tire wear. We don't know which bits of these are the worst. After 50 years of air pollution research, we still can't answer that simple question. And actually, there are hundreds of thousands of chemicals here, many of which are changed through the combustion process, and we have no chance of going after each and every one of them. But what we could do is focus on the sources. And we know that exhausts are important, and particularly from diesel vehicles. Diesel drivers haven't just been penalized because people are trying to get at diesel drivers. The science that diesel emissions are harmful for health is incredibly robust. We also have wood burning, which is a strange thing which is happening in the United Kingdom, that people are deciding to burn wood for sort of like decorative purposes. We have cooking, which we never really thought about until relatively recently. A big slug of the air pollution outside is actually from cooking aerosol. And we have indoor air pollution from consumer goods. And many of these chemicals, once they're released into the air, are transformed in the atmosphere to a range of chemicals we're only beginning to get a handle on. So what are we going to do? Now, I've shown you lots of epidemiology. I'm, I'm a mechanistic toxicology. That's why I'm trying to work out what's going on. And in order to work out what's going on, we were recently funded with a number of partner universities in Manchester, Edinburgh, Birmingham, the University of Dundee, and York to perform and to build what we've called a hazard identification platform. And this is a platform which goes from human volunteers to genetically modified animal models to cell models to try to begin to answer that causation question. And one of the things that we are doing is we've built in Manchester a human exposure chamber where we can actually generate very well controlled concentrations of diesel, wood smoke, cooking aerosol, indoor air pollution. And we are recruiting people at this present moment in time who will breathe these at slightly elevated concentrations. And then we're looking at the impacts acutely on their cognition collecting blood, urine, lavage, nasal lavage samples to begin to look at the relationship between what happens in the lung, happens in the plasma pool, and then that's supported by long-term animal studies. And if anybody is online within your community around the Manchester and the Salford area, we are recruiting into this study now. We did our first exposures um, on Monday of last week. We have people going through the system over the age of 50, we're looking for individuals who have a family member or family history of dementia in their family, yes? So that we can try to capture some of the 
potentially background risk factors. I'm sure these slides will be shared. If you're interested or know anybody who might be interested, and I, again, I'm, I'm, particularly if you live in, in sort of like the northwest within this cohort, this is a really good opportunity to take part in really one of the first major investments in actual the toxicology of understanding how these sources work. And then I'm finally onto my final slide, yes? Why does this matter? It matters because all of those numbers I gave you at the beginning, yes? Are cardiovascular. We haven't added in the cost of dementia to or mental health to any of that health burden. So those numbers I gave you at the beginning are a significant underestimate of the true burden of air pollution on health in terms of quality of life, in terms of lost life, in terms of the impact on the wider society, the things which we care about. But governments care about money. And so I'll just give you a reason why governments should care about this issue. This is the current valuation for the impact of air pollution in the United Kingdom today. DEFRA's quantification, based only on the cardiovascular effects of air pollution, using the Treasury's green book, not some sort of made up statistics, their actual economic government model is 16 billion pounds per year. When this was re-evaluated by the Royal College of Physicians in 2016, they inflated that up to 20 billion. Again, that number is going to be a significant underestimate if we begin to put in the true costs of dementia, which of course then transitions across social care, has huge impacts on, on the wider family. These numbers begin, will be dwarfed, and they are already huge, and they are already of such a scale that governments really do need to be tackling this air pollution issue. If you do tackle it, the benefit you have is it's a benefit to everybody. Everybody benefits from you reducing air pollution because everybody breathes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have maybe a couple of minutes for questions, uh, then we'll break for a 15-minute for a tea break. Um, there will be a Q&A um, bit at the end where we will have about half an hour with, with all the speakers so even if we don't get to any questions we'll be uh, there will be time then if there's a question in the room Two seconds. Uh, hi well, my name's Anne Whitehead I'm from London Borough of Harrow um, and my question is around uh, what you would say to our local authority in Harrow who's objecting to the ultra low Emission zone. Thank you. I have a number of studies evaluating the health impacts of the ultra low emission zone. And one of the motivations for the ultra low emission zone was a study I performed on the impact of air pollution in London on children's lung development and asthma risk. So I have skin in this game, yes? And I know how hot it is. What I would say to any outer London borough is that we understand that they have challenges which are different from the challenges experienced within inner London and outer London. North and South Circular, for people who aren't familiar with London geography. However, this is about health, and I would always turn the argument to health, not to the other conflicting issues which are going on at the moment. And behind all of this, there is the fact that it's been identified as a political polarizing you know, issue. It is not about politics. This is about public health. And I would say woe betide any politician who decides to play a game in which public health is simply a card, yes? I absolutely believe, um, I used to say this to our former mayor, many years ago, um, and I would still say, and I said it because he was a classic scholar, Cicero has a very famous quote, and it is that the public's health is the primary law. It trumps everything else. If you neglect that, you're not looking at deciding whether one issue is better than another issue. You're failing at governance. Should we get rid of our log burning stoves? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we should do. But, okay, what we should definitely not be doing, for example, we're in London, and London's a clean air zone, yes? In London, it is illegal to burn wood. Uh, yet people are installing wood-burning stoves and putting fire pits in their garden. And the reason for that is that um, a law is useless unless a law is enforced, yes? So what we should definitely not be doing is making things worse by promoting the uptake of wood burners for purely decorative lifestyle purposes, yes? We can deal then in a more graduated fashion with sort of potentially sort of, you know, financial sort of sweeteners for people who have that old technology and want to move away from it in other terms. But what we should not be doing is making things worse, even if we're making things worse by technically just looking in the other direction. Ian, online, there's been quite a bit of chat about, um, uh, as, as you've been speaking, and uh, one, one theme that has come through is, is whether it's possible to, to separate the pollution numbers that you've been showing from the economic elements of the areas in which people are living. So, if I was writing to a reviewer of a piece of science I'd done, I would say the following. We have, in all our studies, considered the socioeconomic nature of the areas that we've done. These are effects after controlling for socioeconomic determinants. But they generally are area level, yes? Not individual level. It's very difficult to get individual level on these things. And so they are not perfect. So I would never say that we have fully adjusted for it, but we have adjusted for it as well as anybody can at this point with the data that we have available. Good, okay. So, uh, Simon, presumably there are questions that are still waiting to be answered. So we'll get back to them at the Q&A. In the meantime, we will take a quick break. Uh, here in the room, there's coffee and tea outside. And for those online, uh, I'd, I'd welcome you to, to your own kettles. Um, and then we'll be back, um, we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll hear, at that point, we'll hear from, from Sarah Barmeister about um, the impact of uh, hearing loss and, and vision loss on cognition. And then I'll bring you up to speed with our latest projects on um, screening for dementia. And then we'll have a, a 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A with the speakers. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome back. Are we ready to start? Brilliant. Uh, so we're, we're back from the tea break uh, and straight on to the talk by Professor Sarah Baumeister, who we hopefully have online. Sarah, can, can you confirm yes. we have? Excellent. Yes. Very good. I'm here. <laughs> good to see you. Um, brilliant. So, um, Sarah. Uh, you're an associate professor at the University of Oxford, um, and uh, we're working together where you manage scientific research across a number of multidisciplinary projects, um, and you lead the Life Course Stress and Brain Health Program, uh, where you investigate the effects of early adversity on later life biopsychosocial outcomes in dementia. But uh, I know from our common work that you have a keen interest in hearing loss, uh, and its impact on cognition, and uh, I'm looking forward to, to your talk. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Okay, I think you're operating my slides. So, oh. <laughs> so uh, if we just move forward to the first slide, uh, thank you for that introduction, Ivan. Um, so at the University of Oxford, I lead a programme simply called Modify, 
And um, this is really focused on the understanding of modifying dementia risk through different aspects of lifestyle. So uh, a couple of my team members are working on uh, looking at uh, physical uh, fitness and lifestyle activities and how they impact dementia risk. I have another researcher who, look at, who is looking at super ages and looking at people who are cognitively very healthy, aged 85 and 90 above, and seeing what did they do right or what did they do that benefited a healthy cognitive life cognitive brain at the age of 85 and 90. And I'm really grateful to Dementia's Platform UK and Alzheimer's Research UK who um, funded this programme of very important work, in my opinion. We have the next slide, please. So um, you saw uh, this uh, slide previously in the previous pre presentation very briefly, but I'm just going to go over it very quickly. So this is a uh, figure that was presented in the Lancet Commission on Dementia Risk by Livingston et al. in 2020. And it presented the fact that there are certain activities or uh, lifestyle um, activities that contribute to 40% of dementia risk, such as less education, hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, hypertension, alcohol, obesity, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution and diabetes. And today you heard about air pollution and air pollution is very much connected also to the built environment. So that's really big environmental factors. But what I'm interested in is what can we do in our everyday lives, lives that are relatively easy to change. So some of these factors like less education, that's a quite a, a high one at 7%, and that's quite difficult to adjust, especially once you're older, although that doesn't stop you learning and doing new activities as you get older. But importantly, the second one on this list, hearing loss, is the highest one out of this 40%. And this is people who have grown a little bit older and their hearing is starting to diminish. Rather than um, uh, born deaf at birth, this is actually gradual age-related hearing loss. And that's what I'm going to be referring to today in my presentation. So the next slide, please. So I recently gave a presentation about this to a whole lot of news reporters from across the world. and. And one of the queries was, oh, do we now have to give everyone a new list of things to avoid, things not to do, things to take up? And aren't people really getting tired about being told what to do? When it comes to hearing loss, the impact on other risk factors is really quite important. Hearing loss is also associated with poor balance. Poor balance puts you at risk of falling and falling puts elderly people at a very high risk of traumatic brain injury. Hearing loss, um, people tend to stay at home more when they have hearing loss. They don't want to go out. They don't want to socialize, for example, because it becomes a scary world. It becomes a world that is more difficult to navigate. So once the person reduces physical activity, we tap into yet another risk factor. And again, because they're not socially interactive, this, this lends itself to social increased social isolation, which can then also be associated with poor mental health, such as depression. And then ultimately, over a long period of time, a person with hearing loss who is not going out, is not social, socialising, and is perhaps cutting down on their physical activities, which have become difficult because of hearing loss, can put on weight, be at more risk of obesity and diabetes. So all in all, if you add all of these up, that's 23% of the 40% risk that is almost interrelated with each other. So rather than being a list of do and do not, we can think of these as interacting with each other. Next slide, please. So our recent work has looked at hearing loss and hearing aid use. 
And we were working with a cohort called the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center cohort, over 4,000 individuals followed over 13 years. And what we found was that people were less likely to develop mild cognitive impairment if they wore their hearing aids. So this is people with hearing loss, they wore their hearing aids, they were less likely, and they were less likely, they reduced their risk by 53%. Now this is a high percentage than hearing aid impaired users who did not use their hearing aids. Our further work looked at those with mild cognitive impairment and also hearing impairment. And we found that they had a reduced risk of progression to dementia if they wore their hearing aids, reducing their risk by 14%. Now this was done in the same cohort. It was a longitudinal study. And so we can start looking at causality, as I know that came up in the previous talks about association studies and causality. Now, if we look at the, uh, the next slide, I think it shows very clearly how this, is, how this is graphically represented. In the first one, we call this scenario one. This is people with normal hearing versus people who are hearing impaired. Now, the top line in that top graph shows a natural cognitive change over time. We know that cognition does decline over time, and that is the people with normal hearing. The red line shows those with hearing impairment, and this is the impact longitudinally that hearing impairment has on cognition. In the second scenario, we have people who have hearing loss, but they're wearing their hearing aid, versus those with hearing loss who do not wear their hearing aid. Again, the people who wear their hearing aid, that's the trajectory of cognition at the top. And the trajectory in red is the trajectory of the degree of decline in cognition over time for those who do not wear their hearing aid. Now, the final graph uh, figure is, I think, the one that really um, shows us the message we're trying to, um, to sell, really. And this is people who have hearing loss but wear a hearing aid and those with um, no hearing loss at all. And you can see that the cognitive trajectories over time converge together, showing just how important the impact of wearing a hearing aid on hearing loss is in enduring aging. The next slide, please. However, now there's often a however, a lot of people who, have, who are elderly, or people who have mild cognitive impairment, those with dementia and those with Parkinson's, have a difficulty in actually wearing the hearing aids. So although our work is showing very important findings that can be used to uh, in our further our understanding and implications of the importance of wearing hearing aid, what it doesn't address or look at is how difficult it is for people with cognitive impairment to actually wear a hearing aid. And so what we're trying to do now, and this new, new work is being funded by Alzheimer's Research UK, is to look at these barriers and these difficulties to find out how we can help people to wear hearing aids. So the next slide, please. The idea with this is that if we understand the difficulties, we can start to look at an intervention study. In this case, we will use the Great Minds Network for this uh, registry for this work. And the, the major difficulties we found, we reviewed 544 papers, we removed 105, we screened out 378, which were not appropriate. We reviewed 61 papers and we found only nine papers actually looked at these difficulties. But in summary, the major difficulties with people who are either elderly or cognitively impaired is that they perhaps don't understand the importance of the aid. They have difficulties manipulating the aid and fitting it into their ears. They even forget to use the aid. It's just a simple forgetting. And then also losing the aid, putting it somewhere and not remembering where the aid is. Next slide, please. So. If we look at these pictures of hearing aids, now back in the day, many, many decades ago, this was the top picture is a hearing trumpet. And if people were slightly deaf, 
they simply put the trumpet to their ear, stuck it in, and they could hear conversations. Now, this is a very long time ago, and I'm really glad we've moved on from hearing trumpets. And below that, we see an average hearing aid. It gets manipulated into the ear, and the little back bit gets folded around the ear. On the right hand side, we can see the progression of how hearing aids are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, part of this is comfort technology. We can, um, much like computers, years ago, our uh, desktop computers were enormous. They even filled rooms sometimes uh, way back. And, but the problem is the smaller and, uh, and more discreet they get, because we're all a little bit vain perhaps, and we, you know, there's a bit of a stigma attached to wearing the hearing aid, the more difficult it is for someone who is elderly with cognitive impairment and definitely with Parkinson's to fit the hearing aid into their ear. Next slide, please. So, Although 23% of this 40% can be can perhaps be all related in some way to hearing loss, we can look at those connections between them. If you um, if you have hearing loss, it has an impact on uh, brain injury, obesity, depression. What can we do for those people who simply have difficulty wearing hearing aids? So the next slide, please. So. Our new study, which we're now going to be seeking funding for, and Ivan will be working with me on this new project, and we will hopefully be using, as I said, great minds, is to develop a hearing aid intervention program for individuals with dementia, Parkinson's, and who are simply much older. And so at the moment, if you have a hearing problem, you generally consult your doctor after complaining and turning the televisions too loud for your whole family. And then they will refer you to a further assessment. Either now you can have it done in your local high street um, optician or pharmacy or the doctor. You're given the guidance notes and you're fitted with your hearing aid. And perhaps you go back for a couple of fittings to make sure it's comfortable. But perhaps for people that we've named above, this is not enough for them. So what we want to do is to look at how we can implement a new pathway for individuals who are either elderly, cognitively impaired, or have other additional needs. And that might mean that they go to the doctor, that they have a person assigned to them to identify their individual needs. They still consult with the doctor, the consultant, but instead of just handing them a little leaflet and telling them to take it home, this is how you fit it, look in the mirror, we have an instructional process where they, they come along and there is more visual aids and instructions for this population of individuals. So this is where we, we're hoping to get to with additional funding. And then perhaps we have to look to the way future. And that is, do we need hearing aids that are designed um, especially for this population to make it easier to fit? and easier to put in, to put out. Maybe maybe it has an alarm on that they can find it. And the, you know, these tracker alarms, who knows where technology is going? But either way, we think that we really do need to address this problem. Next slide, please. Another area to address is simply to destigmatize the whole process. Again, in this press conference that I mentioned, I, I happen to say, oh, I think hearing, aid, hearing tests should be promoted for the 30-year-olds upwards. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have to wait for your 60, 70. So, of course, the next day in the press, we've got headlines, have a hearing test in your 30s to, be, to beat dementia. And But perhaps there's some truth in this, that instead of walking past your local high street pharmacy and seeing the cutout sign, and I've seen it recently saying, are you over 65? Come and have your ears tested. We need to actually start promoting this as a life course um, activity. Much as you have your eyes tested every uh, two years, have your hearing tested. One of the editors of one of these newspapers actually wrote in the paper the next day that they were so impacted by this, they went and had a hearing test. They were only in their 30s and they found that they actually did have a hearing problem. So we need to destigmatize hearing tests and destigmatize the wearing of a hearing aid because it can have a huge impact on later cognition. 
Next slide, please. Just want to promote the Alzheimer's Research UK Brain Health Check. If you haven't seen this before, do go and look online because they go through some of these risk factors that have been listed in this Livingston report. And you can plug in your, um, uh, you can answer the questions and they can give you an answer about how well you're looking after your brain. And hearing loss is mentioned amongst the list that they present within their tool. Next slide, please. Now, a question I often get asked with my work is, well, if this is so for hearing, is it the same for wearing glasses? And the answer really is no. Um, at the moment, uh, visual impairment has not been linked with developing dementia, but as far as we know. However, the reasons for this could be that wearing glasses are more socially acceptable than wearing a hearing aid. You're having um, uh, eye tests since you were a child and you grow up wearing glasses as just a normal, uh, a normal everyday piece of clothing. And as you get older, you just move into, unfortunately, ones for reading, or if you're like me, just get very vocals and no one realizes that actually I do need these for reading as well. However, again, much like um, hearing aids, older adults with mild cognitive impairment and dementia find difficulties with wearing glasses, with picking them up, with finding the importance of wearing them and also remembering where they've put them. Next slide, please. So now, although we're saying that uh, the two are not really associated with each other, that if you don't wear your glasses, you're going to develop cognitive decline, there is an important factor about vision and dementia that I think we should all be aware of, that people with dementia may have vision problems such as spatial relationships, depth perception, seeing how, how far something is from them, changes in colour vision, that colours are not quite as, as bright or as clear as they used to be. Reduced peripheral vision. Someone with dementia can't quite, sometimes can't quite see to the sides properly, so sneaking up on them is not a good idea. Difficulties in processing distance, how far something is, where something has been put in context to their own position, and also difficulties processing three-dimensional objects. So although visual loss does not seem to be associated with getting or causing dementia, visual changes may be warning signs that there are brain changes related to vision. And this is very different to what we find with hearing loss. The next slide, please. So there are some existing studies but not, not too many, but one did look at um, the accumulation of amyloid and tau and visual contrast. And, what, and they, they used a task called a frequency, frequency doubling technology. And this is little flashes of light in a computer. And what they did was the reduced ability in adults aged 50 and older to see differences in the flickering light was associated with the accumulation of brain, um, brain and amyl tau amyloid in the brain. I've written it wrong. And, and so this is important work because what this does is it's showing that we do need to understand the connection between vision, vision loss, but importantly, visual changes as we get older and the association with cognitive change. Next slide, please. Um, so our next uh, study that we're busy working on, I see my slides, the, the, the letters have overlapped there a bit. We're looking at the association between vision, uh, dementia and cognition. And um, what we're doing is, and I give credit here to my postdoc, Patrick Flans, and this analysis is in process. We're using UK Biobank, a population of over 24,284 of uh, the members of a biobank, which is actually half a million individuals. And we're looking at how their vision is, is associated with brain function and cognition, because we are wanting to really understand this, uh, this relationship. So our early analyses have shown that mediation 
from the vision from the from the um, eye, from the right eye, it's actually only one eye, is as dementia progresses, so these are individuals we're looking at who've been diagnosed with dementia, that perhaps the brain shuts down information coming from particularly one eye to reduce the information coming into the brain. Now, in other research, they have also found that when the brain is under stress, the eyes, of course, are feeding the information in the brain that there is a shutting down of one side of the, of the vision. And so in our analyses, we found these effects in the poorer vision in just the one side of the eye was associated with a change in cognition. And this also results in the loss of depth perception and also the ability to, to see two versus three dimensionality because of the shutting down of one side of the vision. But this work is really in its infancy. We're trying to understand it a little bit better alongside our hearing aid work. Next slide, please. So what is the conclusion and what is the take home message? It is really to have both your hearing and your vision checked regularly to look after your brain. And the more that we get the message out there that it's normal to have a hearing assessment alongside um, your eye test each year, I think the easier it will be for people as they get older to wear a hearing aid if they experience hearing loss. And a lot of people say to me, what is the mechanism then between hearing loss and cognition? Why does this happen? Now, a lot of these answers we're hoping to answer in our own programme of work over the next year or three years. But one, one a couple of hypotheses, I'll answer them now because they're probably in the questions, is that someone with hearing loss as they get older, the cognitive resources that are working really hard to hear conversations, to hear the television, to pick up different sounds, are working so hard on hearing that they are diminished from normal cognitive function. So the focus is all on hearing functions, the, the hearing brain relationship. Also, for someone, as we said right in the beginning, that when they have hearing loss and they shut down their social circle, they stop going out, they stop meeting friends, and they stop just doing all their everyday jobs as their world shrinks, so does the opportunity for cognitive enrichment. But this work, I must stress, is still ongoing to further understand these associations. Next slide, please. I thought I was at the end. So um, I hope that uh, this was informative and that you learned a bit about what we're trying to understand with both vision and hearing and brain function as you get older. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, time for a couple of questions. None immediately in the room. Um, Sarah, have any similar studies been conducted with cochlear implant users? And what were the results if, if there have been? To my knowledge, I haven't, um, I, I don't know about any studies, but that's a really interesting question. And I think that we should uh, really incorporate that into our work. So thank you. And, and Sarah, perhaps related to this, um, people develop hearing loss at a variety of at, at, at various stages in their life have you have you looked into whether getting it early on in life um, has a sort of a disproportionate impact on future dementia risk you work a lot on, a lot on adversity and looking at early life risk factors so is there a relationship as in, in early life hearing loss and dementia risk so um, again, to our knowledge, there is there is not uh, there's not significant work done in this field. So what we'd like to do with our future work is to look not only at the different ages that, at which uh, hearing loss occurs and the association with brain function, but also to look at the different types of brain function that it impacts. So it might be. For example, that if your hearing loss um, goes at an earlier age, it might impact. Now, this is just an example, 
executive function, but at another age, it might impact memory. So this is really the type of work that we would like to answer over the next three years. Sarah, is it the inability to hear or is it missing out on social interaction that's the problem? If you communicated with people via sign language instead of using hearing aids, would the risk be the same? So this is a very important point because this relates to people who are born deaf, who learn sign language and um, can communicate it in just a different way. And I think that what this, the existing research is leaning towards, that it's this shutting down of communication, which people have been used to up until a certain point. So if, for example, you have hearing loss and you, are, you have developed skills for lip reading and for sign language, and it's not stopping you get out there and communicate and socialize, then I would imagine and this is this again is the type of research which we would like to understand more that it will have less impact than someone who suddenly is used to relying on hearing and they suddenly start to lose it so um again it's about communication and the shutting down of the world due to hearing loss and one final one just to finish on and maybe a bit unfair but i'll ask it anyway um one of the people online has said that their 91-year-old mother will not wear her newly prescribed hearing aids and definitely fits the criteria of losing out. How could that person encourage her mother to wear the hearing aids? Well, perhaps, perhaps you can tell her about this talk. <laughs> uh, perhaps you can tell her how good it is for her brain, because I think that a lot of people certainly don't realise that. So um thank you very much sarah so we'll come back to you in 10 minutes when we'll have the q a uh, in the meantime i'll take a few minutes to uh, walk you through one of the one of the main initiatives we have at the moment in the great minds project itself uh, if you can load up my slides um and, and it, it's really tackling the question of, of whether we're there yet in terms of, uh, in terms of screening for, for dementia risk. Uh, that is, as I mentioned earlier, that is a very important question because it is clear to us that dementia is, is a condition which, is, which takes decades of, uh, of, of developing uh, before it actually causes the damage that, that we see as doctors. Um, and that in, provides an important opportunity to, uh, to, to intervene and stop the, the process before, uh, before the, the changes that we can't reverse set in. Uh, and that becomes even more, um, more relevant now that we, we, have, we live in an age where um, there, are, there are novel therapies which clear off the uh, Alzheimer's disease protein. You may have heard about this, and they're coming, and they will be with us over the next... Uh, two to, to four years is my, uh, is my prediction here in the UK. It will be something that will be pre prescribed to patients. Um, and we need to have a very clear understanding of who it is that we should be prescribing these, these drugs to. And, and that's why I think now is the right time to be thinking about the value of screening. Uh, and that's what we're working on in, in great minds. We're focusing on two main, on, on the two main ways that, are, that, are, that we believe are feasible in, in tracking one's risk of dementia as, 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 as one ages, and that's using blood biomarkers and digital technology. Um, on the next slide, uh, this, is what, this, is what I, this, this is what I've just talked to you, so we'll move to the next slide. Why, why blood biomarkers? There's Blood biomarkers have, is the holy grail of, of medicine for a variety of reasons. But the chief one is that it is the, the type of, 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 if you like, body fluid that we can, we can get easily. Everyone, you know, with, a, with, a, with a, uh, any medical service can, can basically get it. Uh, you don't need highly specialist equipments. Um, and um, 
then the skill level uh, really is, is, is pretty low. So every specialty in medicine, uh, when it comes to diagnostics, is generally geared towards can we develop a blood test to, to define it. And the field of Alzheimer's has been, has been struggling towards this for the past at least 30 or 40 years, and it really is in the past five that things have suddenly shifted. Um, what shifted is, was a change in technology, um, as 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 things as things develop, um, one of the one of the key uh, one of the key advances was that we now have uh, the type of machine that can detect very small levels of of proteins, uh, and what that's allowed us to do is to check whether Alzheimer's disease proteins that are in the brain, um, they're they you know they reach only in very small quantities in in the bloodstream. And only now are we able to pick up these tiny, tiny quantities of, of protein in the blood. The other thing, and this is what you, you this is what you're seeing on the screen. On the left is is the best validated blood test, which is called phosphorylated tau. Um, I, we've spoken at these seminars in the past about proteins of Alzheimer's disease, but very simply, tau is is a protein which occurs naturally. It's, it's the type of protein that keeps the nerve cells together. So it's a structural protein and it's very good for you. But what happens in Alzheimer's disease is that there is a change to this protein and it's no longer able to, to be this, if you like, uh, structural, if you like, an engineering protein and it becomes instead a very toxic protein. And it starts to clump within, within the nerve cells uh, and it causes and it causes damage, um, and and this type of change to the tau protein is something that really only happens in Alzheimer's disease, and for that reason, um, there's been a lot of interest in trying to detect it. And now we have a blood test which looks at this at the level of this. Uh, it's called phosphorylated protein, so this changed tau structural protein. Um, and on the left, you have one of the one of the first papers that really set the scene, which showed that uh, if we're looking at blood uh, in, in patients with Alzheimer's disease, these are the blue, the dark blue squares that you have uh, there. These are, pe these are people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Um, their levels of, of, this, of this protein in the blood is significantly higher compared to, uh, compared to the people who are cognitively normal on the left in, in brown. And over time, this technology uh, got developed, but at very quick um, at very quick rate, uh, and and what we now have is a is a fairly effective uh, blood biomarker uh, to detect whether somebody has uh, developing Alzheimer's disease pathology in their brain. And on the right, you have the other main the other main uh, blood test that we're looking at these days. Uh, it's called neurofilament light. Uh, so neurofilament light is is another protein which is 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 you know is a very useful structural protein in the brain in that it keeps the long protrusions of the of the nerve cells the the so called axons it keeps them in, in good shape and it's the sort of protein that gets released whenever nerve cells start to lose these protrusions so for example if you have multiple sclerosis which affects uh, which affects the, the axons, the, 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 long, the long part of the neurons, you get a huge release of this protein. Um, and for that reason, neurofilament light has been of, of great interest, certainly in multiple sclerosis. But as the test for multiple sclerosis got developed, uh, people realized that actually this is a fairly effective way of also looking at, at whether there's cell death. Uh, whether the, the nerve cells in the brain are dying off faster than, than, than expected. And when they took this to Alzheimer's disease, they saw studies like this in the past. This is the gray graph, uh, which shows, again, on the right, you have people with Alzheimer's disease. In the middle, you have people with mild cognitive impairment, uh, which is this, uh, this risk state for dementia. And then uh, you have the, the, the healthy aging individuals. And the people who have an Alzheimer's disease, so an active dementia, uh, have significantly increased levels of this protein in the blood. So between these two, between these two tests, we now have uh, essentially very effective ways to detect, on the one hand, whether somebody has 
Alzheimer's disease pathology in the brain, even if they don't have any symptoms. So some people have shown that they can detect amyloid protein 10, 15 years before people uh, get any symptoms. And on the other hand, you have this protein which shows you whether there's ongoing nerve cell loss. Uh, so two, two very, uh, very um, you know, important steps forward in being able to use simple blood tests to, to determine what somebody's risk for dementia is. And on the next slide is the second opportunity, which is digital technology. Um, digital technology is important for screening for dementia because of a, of, of a very simple reason, and that is that the way we currently do things in the clinic uh, when I see patients uh, is, is not fit for purpose, as in um, a, a nurse that works with me will sit down with a, with a pen and paper test and they'll spend half an hour drawing shapes and, and, and pointing at animals, uh, which, is, which is fine. But unfortunately, that means that, one, this is a, a test that is very difficult to scale. This is not a screening method because we cannot be checking people's cognition in this way on, a, on, a, on the scale that, that really we're facing in an aging population. Uh, it's just too labor intensive. And the second problem is that this type of test uh, using paper, using pen and paper, has only been validated as in has been shown to distinguish people who have developed dementia versus people who are cognitively healthy. So you have to be, uh, you have to be seriously Im impaired in order for you to show up as, as impaired on one of these pen and paper tests. And the game has shifted. So now we're looking to identify people who are in a much earlier stage so we can intervene before they get any very serious impairment. And for that purpose, pen and paper tests are just not sensitive enough. But if we look at digital technology, digital technology offer some critical advantages. On the one hand, it, it's clearly very scalable. So most people now have access to digital technology. So the investment from a healthcare point of view is is minimal in that most people have iPads or smartphones or a computer at home and they can just log in online and do a quick test for 10 minutes in their own home. Sure. So I, I appreciate that That's for, for people online, uh, sort of a member of the audience said that it took, it took them 30 minutes, but you can see how on the healthcare system level, I think being able to do these things in half an hour without the, the need for a nurse to be there guiding you is still a massive, massive win and a, and a, and a, and a way forward for, for, for tracking people's cognition over time. And then the second component is that through this digital technology, we can actually, um, we can actually change the difficulty of the tests so that it, it sort of it understands at what stage you're starting to struggle and really hone in and, 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 and uh, uh, if you like, adapt the task so that it's, it's suitable to, to your particular level. So between these two things, you can see how digital technology is, is, is a potential way forward. So what we're doing in Great Minds on the next slide is, oh, uh, one, more, one more thing to say is that in addition to, um, to, to the fact that it's very scalable and it allows a much more much more fine detailing of people's cognitive function. It also does something that we, it's just impossible to do in the clinic, and that is to look at what people call accelerated forgetting. Okay, So in the clinic at the moment, I can do the test with you, and I can ask you, can you remember these five words, and then I can test how long, you know, whether you remember them. But the most we can test this for is probably on the lines of half an hour. Okay. While we know that if there's a way that we can ch check people's memory two, three, four, five, six, seven days later, we're starting to see to seeing changes that are, are simply not there. Uh, if if I was if I, if I was to ask about people's memory at 30 minutes, so with digital technology, and this is something that we've shown using uh, this particular app, we were shown we've shown that. On smartphones, we can start to test people's memory three, four, five days after they've learned something, and we can start to see this this drop off in memory uh, that's only starting three, four, three to five days after they've learned the information. And on the next slide is what happens when when you when you release something like this. So this is an app that we released through uh, and a, a 
a project with Alzheimer's Society. This is where it got, got downloaded uh, in the country. Uh, clearly, a lot of people are, are, are in the big cities, but you also get red spots in places that uh, are not part of, you know, that, that, are not, that are not part of uh, large cities. And it really drives home that it is something that we can, if you like, uh, we can use to democratize access and to, uh, to allow people who are not close to a major university center to take part in dementia research. And the fact is that the demand and the take up is there. And on the next slide is what we're actually doing in Great Minds. Uh, we are offering uh, essentially people who are uh, healthy aging or people with mild cognitive impairment and people with dementia to come in and do a, a blood test uh, and also to do some, some of our digital tests. And then we repeat that after a year. One of the main things is we want to find out what's people's attitude to, to being screened for dementia because we haven't really tested that so far. We assume that everyone is, is very happy to do this, but you don't know until you've, you've actually done it to people uh, and, and assessed you know, what, what's, what's, their, what's their reaction to having their, their risk of either future dementia or dementia progression uh, tested. And then the other one is that specifically for great minds, it will give us hugely valuable data once we extract these proteins that I was talking about to then be able to offer those people that part in, take part in this study the you know, uh, studies that are very well matched to, to, their, to their personal risk of dementia. So we're running this study. It's called the FAST study. Uh, if you want to talk to us about it, by all means, uh, come to us or drop us a line. Um, at the moment, it's running, it's running on the, in Oxford, but we've got 15 sites around the UK who will be opening up the study shortly. So uh, even if uh, you don't, you're not local to Oxford, we will be opening sites near to you very soon. Um, and I believe that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, to Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I'd like to ask uh, my... Uh, Ivan, do you want to ask... Do you want to take any questions? Oh, of course. Uh, but we can, we can do that during the, during the main Q&A. So, Ian, if you'd like to, to join me, and also if we can uh, switch to the online view, uh, where hopefully we're going to see the faces of John and Sarah. Um, and we're going to open up to any questions. I'm Just very happy to start from mine, if, if you've got a couple. There's, a, there's one specific. Why starting age of 55? Right, OK. Um, it's, it's a good question. Uh, it stems back on some research we did with, um, with the National Institute of Health in, in the US, where they have these research studies, because it's the US and they have a lot of money to actually follow people up from, essentially they started following people up from their 40s, uh, and looking at the levels of Alzheimer's disease proteins in, in their cerebral spinal fluid, so in their, in their spinal fluid. And what we were able to show is that there is an inflection point at which people start to accumulate Alzheimer's disease proteins at a, at a, at a faster rate compared to how they, how, they, how they were going before that. And that point tends to be in people's mid-50s. So there is a switch-on moment where things change, something happens in the brain, and it starts to become much more prone to Alzheimer's disease, and it's around that, it's around that age, mid-50s. If you have genetic risk for, for Alzheimer's, it happens in your early 50s. But if you do not, and you have regular risk for Alzheimer's, it's, it's sort of mid to late 50s. And that's why, if you, if you think again of dementia as a, as a condition which takes about 20 years to, to develop, that's why we see the peak of Alzheimer's disease dementia in people in, in, their, in their mid to late 70s and, and early 80s. So, so that's why we're focusing on that age group. But of course, as, as we'll hear from, from Sarah, brain health is, is, is a lifelong, is, is a condition of... Uh, of, of lifelong uh, sort of events and impacts. So it's never too early to, to, uh, to start looking after your brain health. I think we have a, a question already. Um, we've referred quite a lot this afternoon to MCI and Sarah's uh, reference to um, hearing loss. I was wondering if um, sleep patterns and <clears throat> um, sleep difficulties like sleep apnea uh, also set against um, 
shift work and sleep disturbances. Also thinking about people who go to bed late, get up late, people who go to bed early and get up early. If, if those affect development towards Alzheimer's or... Um, yeah. Sleep, sleep and dementia is a fascinating area. I don't know what, whether one of the epidemiologists in, in the room wants to, wants to take a... Um, I can certainly give you my reading of the literature and the reason why I'm personally very interested and, and as a result why we're collecting sleep data in great minds is that there is a very, very well-defined relationship uh, between sleep and dementia in that starting from epidemiological studies, uh, they've shown that sleeping too little, uh, sort of on the region of less than five hours per night, or sleeping too much, so more than nine hours, both associate with, uh, with dementia risk and cognitive problems. Uh, and in addition, uh, there, is a, there is a phase of sleep, which is called the deep, the deep, uh, the deep sleep, uh, during which... Uh, we now know that the spaces in between the nerve cells, if you like, expand, and that's when all the byproducts of the, the work of the nerve cells during the waking hours get sucked out of the neurons get, and then get cleared off when, 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 this, when this deep sleep happens. So this particular, so what that means is that this particular uh, time during the sleeping cycle is very, very important for clearing off uh, proteins associated with Alzheimer's disease. So the less sleep you have, the more there's going to be the opportunity for this, uh, for these Alzheimer's disease proteins to stick around. And there were a, there's one particular one one interesting study that uh, that showed thinking specifically about the amyloid protein, which as as you probably know is a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Um, they did an experiment with healthy volunteers uh, where they took their level of amyloid. Uh, before any intervention, and then they went through just one night of not being allowed to sleep, okay? So complete sleep deprivation, and they did another amyloid scan immediately afterwards. So these are healthy volunteers, no dementia, uh, and they show that just with this single, single night of sleep deprivation, their amyloid levels were, were significantly higher, right? So, so sleep has a, has a very, very important uh, uh, has has an immediate importance in clearing off Alzheimer's disease proteins, and and it has been shown in a number of studies that, as I say, too little sleep or too much sleep uh, associates with with Alzheimer's disease and and dementia in general. I don't know whether anyone else wants to comment on sleep. John, you look like uh, you have a thought. <coughs> well, I, <coughs> I have a thought. The question is, do I have a lung? Um, I, I think the. Uh, what you've described in terms of the benefits of deep sleep is absolutely right. What, are, what interests me is whether the mechanisms are the same for people who <clears throat> do not uh, uh, get sufficient deep sleep and for those people who get uh, uh, much, what we would describe as uh, long periods of sleep, which are unhelpful. Uh, I wonder whether for the period, people who sleep for a long time, it may be more of an emotional disturbance. Uh, a depression or a mood disorder which is affecting that. Um, I don't know if that is true, but I would be very surprised if it was the same mechanism uh, operating in, in people who were sleeping too little and people who are sleeping too much. We have a, we have a question in the room. Yes. Um, I, I walk regularly with a group of people, about 20 every week, uh, um, quite long distances, all over 60. And there's a very common within my peer group of, uh, of people uh, who forget people's names, who can't recall, put strange things in the fridge, all this sort of behaviours. And it makes you wonder, uh, I don't think it's very clear how much of that is normal. I can't believe 20 of us have got dementia. But I, so I can't believe, I don't understand how many of us, it's just normal ageing. And, and what, what does it then become abnormal ageing, if you like? You know, what are the signals to say to some of us, actually, this is not just, you know, the fact that you're getting a bit old? 
yeah, very, very good, very good question. You know, what what is the division between normal or, or what what cognitive decline should we expect in in normal aging? In a way, Sarah, John, Ian, does do you, does anyone want to take this, or shall I go? Over to you, Ivan. Yeah, it's 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 a brilliant it's a brilliant point, and we obviously um, it's, as clinicians we have to sort of very often sort of counsel people who come in who are worried about their memory. Um, so my reading of the literature and, and what we certainly tell in clinic is that what you should expect in, uh, as part of normal aging is a slowing down of the, of the processing. So people who are at 80 are simply not as fast cognitively uh, to people who are uh, in, their, in their 20s. Okay. Once you know, in, in fact, once you sort of you go over your sort of your mid twenties, your brain is is in decline. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's just the way that's just the way the way the way our body works. Now, there is, however, a, a, a level of cognitive impairment which is not part of normal aging. And you're right; sometimes it's difficult to differentiate. But in general, uh, you know, anything that is frank memory problems. So difficulty recalling recent events, it it's it's worth checking out. Uh, it would be very unusual, however, for somebody in in their sixties to have dementia unless they have a a, a family history of somebody, their mum and dad, having had dementia at a very early age. So. Um, in a way, I think that's where we're going with some of these studies that we're running, is we're trying to understand exactly using digital technology, using blood biomarkers, at what stage is this normal, you know, should we be setting, if you like, the, the standard for people to get checked out as part of normal aging. We've got another question in the room, but before we do that, one of the questions online, because there's a few... Of the known environmental stroke lifestyle factors associated with dementia, can they be categorised or scored in terms of their aggressiveness? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to go? Can they be scored? You can always score something. It's whether there's a consensus that how you've scored it is accurate, and it's going to be reflected by people's particular biases because all scientists think that the thing that they study is the simply most important thing in the entire world. I do think behind the question is this issue of compound risk, um, which we began to get to in Sarah's presentation, where we began to move beyond looking at individual classifications to looking at groupings of risk factors and their interdependence. And I think probably that's where we've got to move to, not giving everything an individual score, but understanding the relationship between risk factors. Almost like, I mean, this is going to sound terrible, like clusters of risk, yes? And how we deal with what are the actual nodes within that cluster of risk, which if you tackle it, it gives you the, the most benefit across all of those domains. It's a mistake to, I think, put them in a list and then try to tick them off one by one. Mm. Yeah. Sarah, John? Do you want to? No, I, I, I agree with that, actually. The, <clears throat> the, um, you know, we live in a realistically complex world and, you know, the causal patterns uh, go both ways. And, you know, it's, we, we're talking about small effects here in combination. So I, I, I think, <clears throat> given the current state of knowledge, uh, to look at uh, clusters of behaviours, of risk factors that we can uh, uh, affect collectively and easily uh, is, is how I would proceed. So, for example, if you want to do exercise, it's very simple. Find something you enjoy doing, um, find something, uh, a time when it's convenient, and find people you can do it with. And I think the, uh, the, the, uh, the walking group that was described a few moments ago is a perfect example of that, and that will give you multiple benefits. Uh, I think if you're talking about <clears throat> specific pathways of neurodegeneration, which you're targeting for drug intervention, it's a different question. You know, that is sort of a, a therapeutic development pipeline, which does have to be very, very specific. But when you get into a sort of a public health and look after your brain perspective, um, <clears throat> think in the large scale of, of, uh, 
of interventions that work together and are and are convenient and, uh, if at all possible, enjoyable. Good. We have a question in the room. Uh, is there any value in brain training, games, or exercises? <laughs> um, cognitive remediation, brain training. Do we have takers online or? Okay, let me let me have a quick stab at this, just to save everybody else's embarrassment. Um, <clears throat> I think the evidence is mixed. Um, uh, that brain training will help you uh, is is beyond doubt. <clears throat> but will it help you to do things other than the skill that you've learned in brain training? Um, that's really where the you know uh, is the cognitive benefit transferable. <clears throat> And then I would argue that there is uh, what I would describe as a hardware and software problem. Uh, if I'm using my software efficiently, um, <clears throat> then it will improve my, my performance. Now, whether that's affecting the hardware of my brain, um, the neurodegeneration, is another matter. It could be. It really could be. Uh, I think there are benefits in brain training, um, but I don't think the evidence is clear that because I can improve my reaction time and my memory um, for abstract titles or abstract subjects, I will necessarily remember names better. I think there is an argument for, for brain training being a, there, there being a definite value of it being a, where it's considered as a lifelong sort of um, activity. So wh where I'm coming at with this is that there is very clear evidence that higher education levels uh, are protective against dementia. So there are, there are studies looking at the brains of people who, who died uh, and then uh, looking at the education levels. And, and what is a very consistent finding is that people of higher education level have often Alzheimer's disease pathology or dementia pathology, and yet they died cognitively normal. Right, so there is something there is something in the way in which we live our life intellectually uh, that, if you like, creates this extra reserve in the brain. That then means that even if you're even if the nerve tissue itself is uh, is is affected by dementia, this, if you like, uh, lifelong buildup of of resilience is able to compensate for this. So, but this is not cognitive training as a, as a sort of as a as a goal directed activity when you start to see that your memory is failing this is more about how do we how do we lead our lives and, and how if you like education is thought about as a brain protection mechanism can i ask a question related of course to that? because i'm a newbie go yes, on and so i feel as though i should be able to ask a question um you know i can tolerate a small number of people Seldomly, I need lots of time away from people. That's just the way my brain works. But is should we be thinking about socialization as we age, as being brain training, but a more sort of organic, wholesome form of brain training? Absolutely, absolutely. And and you know, uh, social activity has been shown to be a great predictor of who actually converts into into dementia because ultimately, being around people is a very cognitively demanding task. Right. Uh, every time you're communicating to somebody, even if you don't feel it, your brain is constantly picking up signal, modifying your own behavior, trying to understand what the uh, what 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 is what is going on, what's being said, what's not being said, picking up, but uh, you know, nonverbal language. Um, and so, in a way, it's a very cognitively demanding task. And uh, we know that people who stay socially engaged. Uh, throughout their life, and including in, in all their life, other people who stay cognitively healthy. So, yeah. The next question then, is there a time when it's too late to change our lifestyles in order to prevent dementia, i.e. giving up smoking or drinking? Um, oh, please, please let me comment on that. Please, John, John. <laughs> no, it's never too late. Now, obviously, that depends on the risk factors. So, for example, um, if your body's uh, thoroughly acclimatized to smoking, uh, the levels of white cells, et cetera, et cetera, will come down um, slowly, uh, and your risk of uh, heart disease will come down slowly. So if you're 105 
and you think you've got six months left, it's probably not worth it, you know. Uh, enjoy your cigarettes. Uh, but if you're about 65, it really is worth it. Uh, and the uh, graphs I showed is that exercise benefits everyone. So it really is never too late. And, you know, the, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The next best time is today. So I would really start today. And, and to that point, specifically for smoking, smoking is the one of the few risk factors where it's very clearly been shown that the moment you stop smoking uh, is when you actually start to modify your risk for, for dementia. So uh, essentially ex-smokers have a very similar risk to dementia of people who have never smoked. Uh, so it really pays off to, to, smoke, to stop smoking, while current smokers have a persistently elevated, uh, elevated risk. You have another question, Simon. I've got several, Ivan, so um, we'll keep going. Um, there's a few follow-ups to, to the uh, answer you gave a few moments ago on education level. Um, and to summarise, does the type of education matter? Uh, um, is it causative? So do people capable of being successful in higher education have lower incidence of dementia? Uh, and is being educated or would learning for yourself qualify? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're really getting into what we probably don't know a lot about in terms of in terms of education. Um, Sarah, do you, do you have a view on on these the intricacies of relationship between levels of education and uh, risk for dementia? I think uh, when it comes to the level, I think we're really talking about the importance of continuous education. So. When I give talks to uh, various groups around the country, I often say, even if you're watching television and you're trying to answer all the quizzes on university challenge, that in a way is education. And so I think that we've got to be education if it's new or structure, such as degrees and uh, et cetera. That education is really lifelong, and um, you can, and even through brain training, um, it's to find where you are um, accessing your information. Okay, great. You broke up a little bit there, uh, Sarah, but I think we, we got the message. Simon, next one. Uh, Okay, uh, on back to the earlier topics of today. Can we design cities and towns to meet the needs of everyone if we engage in master planning rather than being privately developer-led? Sorry, private developer-led. Did you hear that, John? <laughs> well, um, there's a question. Um, I, I think if I was to answer that honestly, I, I'd say uh, that that really depends what you mean. Um, for example, uh, the fact that we put sewers in is imperative. Um, the particular specific sewer design uh, can vary as long as it meets you know, basic uh, uh, criteria. And it's for government, and I mean local government, national government, based on evidence, to establish the criteria. Now, the, ex the, at the point at which the big national plan loses its efficiency, and loses its ability to be locally sensitive, it's really a natural experiment. We really don't know. Um, so I'm not ideological on this. Uh, I'm really looking for the best solution. And uh, I would take that on a case by case basis. What you really do not want is just random developments. Uh, that just ruins life for everyone. So a bit of thought, bit of consultation, um, looking for the best solution in that particular situation. Great. I wonder if I can sneak in a question about air pollution. Um, uh, I wonder what you what we've learned from from the whole natural experiment of COVID uh, about you know what it means not to have traffic uh, in in big cities for for uh, for a period of time. What what have we learned from that? What we've learned is that what people believe happened to traffic during the COVID epidemic isn't really what happened. Oh, right. to traffic during the COVID epidemic. So there were certain parts of cities which were very, very quiet. There were certain bits of cities which had huge amounts of traffic carrying goods backwards and forwards, yes. So it's not quite that there was suddenly a massive reduction in all pollution. There was a reduction in certain types of pollution. So I talked about NO2 and exhaust emissions, and very much that fell. 
Now, I don't know what the neurological impact was, but in terms of asthma, which is another area of interest, yes, the number of asthma exacerbations, hospital attendances, medication use fell through the floor, yes? And as the traffic began to pick back up on our streets, we began to see the impact of it filtering back in. Now, whether that's air pollution per se, or the fact that people were living indoors more often, or there were fewer circulating viruses in the community, that's a different thing. But there are lots of natural exam experiments, and I was just going to get back to the issue about urban mm -hmm. design, um, because I spend a lot of time. We kind of know, for example, air pollution, what the solution is. We know that the solutions are government policy, and we know they're not going to do it or well, they're going to do everything in their power not to do it, and that actually it's a continual battle to prevent developments. So, for example, I advised many um, air pollution plans in many boroughs in London. I've sat down with them, I've planned them, and they still build schools and nurseries next to the busiest roads. We have a house-building programme, which is predominantly building on ex-contaminated land with regulations being removed, building near to busy roads. And so unfortunately at the present moment in time, money is winning the argument and the economic arguments are winning against the public health arguments. What would be interesting is comparing countries which have been very good at doing this and countries which have actually put public health into their urban design strategies with countries which maybe have been less successful and looking at the heterogeneity in some of our health endpoints when you actually compare across the board. I would be really interesting to see what the neurological endpoints are, say Copenhagen mm. versus a similarly sized, similar demographic city elsewhere. And I'm, I'm sure there's some work that we could done there. Mm. Yep. We, we, we're going past time now, but there's probably a couple more we could ask. Sure. Probably one for, possibly one for Sarah. Has tinnitus been considered in connection with dementia? Yes, I actually uh, read a study recently that um, does not connect tinnitus with dementia. Um, because I was asked this question in a previous presentation, I, I found a paper. So at the moment, there is no connection between tinnitus and dementia. Thank you. And maybe thinking forward to future treatments, what are your views on light therapy, photobiomodulation for dementia? There seems to be more, the trials seem to be more advanced in the US than they are in the UK. Well, it's, it's a, certainly an exciting area of research and uh, this, this is a very, very new field. You know, no one was talking about this 10 years ago. Um, and so the, the data that's coming out is primarily coming out of, uh, out of preclinical research, but it, it's certainly very intriguing. Uh, there's, there's a number of these potential therapies. It's not only phototherapy, but also um, uh, not, not just photolite therapy, but uh, there's, there's, there's other, if you like, th uh, therapeutic modalities looking at... Um, uh, at, at, at magnetic pulses and uh, other such, if you like, physical type of, uh, of of therapies. I believe the field is going to uh, is going to accelerate in the next ten to fifteen years because, uh, we, as I say, we now live in a world where there is a a type of dementia treatment which will start to get prescribed. People are going to get these anti these amyloid clearance therapies which are going to come at a high cost, and they're going to get associated with significant side effects, but they will, they have been shown to essentially change the course of Alzheimer's disease. And then there will be, what the flip side of this will be, that there will be very big interest in seeing what else could we do as an alternative. So therapies like these that, that uh, this question was, was talking about, I believe that we're going to see a lot of investment as an alternative. Is an increase in intolerance a uh, symptom of developing poor cognition? Uh, so, say again, so you just elaborate a bit. Uh, an in is an increase in tolerance or a, a decrease in, uh, or, um, of, sorry, an increase of, of intolerance, yeah. If you become more intolerant, 
does it suggest you might be having oh, an impre oh an okay as in irritability intolerance yeah. sort of as a character sort of uh, yeah um, well it certainly is uh, something that can happen in in certain rare types of, of dementia you know I'm thinking frontotemporal dementia where you know people become much more irritable but it tends to be quite extreme right it's not something that is quite subtle but rather people come in and that's the main complaint right you know that people are getting into fights with with strangers well before that they were the most placid character so and apart from that I think as as we as we all age there's certainly uh, you know a type of if you like character change that happens and sometimes it can take the form of of, of being you know slightly less likely to suffer fools uh, with, with age so I, I you know I would say that you know if it's if it's extreme irritability that's causing problems certainly worth checking but at the same time we do see that as people as people age there is a an, an understandable change in changing their character which is not not pathological as such happy to have one more so, general question it, it, Dan, if I, yeah. if I could chip in there yeah please um, my wife just calls me grumpy mm. um, it, it's very simple and, I, and I've been analyzing I mean why, why do I get grumpy and I think that particularly for men um, uh, you, you have to work harder to deliver your performance you know in order to uh, compete at work in order to uh, manage your life um, because energy levels just just go and, and it, life is just harder work so so I, I think there's an issue of, of just being wise you know one of the lovely things about getting older uh, and I mean it's a really lovely thing is that you have this stock of experience uh, which you can share with people um, and play to that strength and see your value in what you're offering in terms of life experience rather than what you're delivering in terms of goals and, and uh, initiatives. That, that has made a lot of difference to me, although really you should ask my wife to see if it, what I say is true. Final one, Simon. There are many types of dementia. What are the takeaways on minimizing or testing cognitive impairment in general? So it's true that there's a number of types of dementia, but at the same time, the people who have problems uh, as, that you know essentially end up being diagnosed as dementia tend to present not too dissimilarly uh, in that, uh, you know, if you're noticing that your memory in particular is not as good as it used to be about recent events, that's certainly something that uh, is, is worth checking out. Um, and then... Very, and, and then the other thing we talked about, which is very significant character change. I think between these two things, you've got most of, of, the, of the serious uh, conditions that lead to dementia, lead to dementia covered. Uh, that's what I would say. Do we have any other comments on, on what's the main commonality between dementias? No. John, can I ask you one last question on the, on the healthy cities things? We talked about healthy cities as a way to preserve brain function. What about creating cities around people for, you know, essentially with dementia? Is that, is that the way forward? Uh, we, we, you know, there are sort of whole dementia villages that, are, that, are, that have been created. Is that a sort of a suitable way forward, sort of creating an environment around people with dementia? Or is the value in living together with people with dementia to continue to stimulate them cognitively? So th this, I think, is a really interesting philosophical question. China is brilliant in the sense that very efficient at building dementia-friendly cities. Um, we can define city how we, how we like. Um, <clears throat> and in, 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 at one level, in the short term, you can see that it is a solution to a problem uh, where there is no next generation uh, to uh, care for and benefit from uh, <clears throat> older people. 
Uh, my, my personal preference is that, uh, and you could call this an age effect, um, is that I want to be around um, my grandchildren. You know, I want to be there uh, for my children. Um, and I, I can't really do it uh, if I'm in a, a relatively socially distinct, effectively gated uh, community. Uh, but I can understand that, you know, why China thinks it is a suitable solution, uh, given their socio-demographic context. But for me, I want to be a really grumpy old man to all my, all my grandchildren for as long as possible. Very good. Excellent. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank the speakers that are uh, to Ian, who's here, and to Sarah and John, who are online. I'd like to thank everyone who came in. I'd like to thank everyone who's online. Big thanks to Simon, Rod, Claire, who helped, who not helped, who organized this, this event and that continue to do a brilliant job. Uh, and with that, I wish you an excellent evening. Thank you very much. Oh, Facebook, last thing, last thing. If you want to get in touch with us and find out about how we're, how we're doing things, thank you very much, Rod. Um, we have, you can, you can get in touch with us through Facebook, so just look for Dementia's Platform UK. Uh, and uh, it's, it, we're going to be updating our, our Facebook presence regularly, so uh, it's, it's one of the ways to, to uh, keep abreast of developments. Thank you very much.